This week was all about heat. Record temperatures in Europe and the United States, concerns whether Europeans can heat their homes this winter, and central banks trying to take the heat out of prices on both sides of the Atlantic. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard on the growing divergence among the economies of the United States, Europe, and China. They've got an aspect to their problem that we don't have in the United States. This is pushing Europe in the right direction in a dangerous situation. And Brian Moynihan of Bank of America on how we can feel so bad when the economy appears to be doing so well. What they're saying they see versus what they're doing is kind of interesting. That's the Fed's toughest challenge. It may be summer, but temperatures this week were ridiculous, even for mid-July, with records broken in London. I'm pretty, pretty desperate. I mean, there is sweat running down everybody's backs. Wildfires in Spain. We have never be, uh, seen that condition on, on the fire, never. It's, it's completely new for us. And misery throughout much of the United States. This climate debate in a very hot America. Washington, D.C., normal 101, 102 here in a couple uh, days, but it is a serious issue. And if this heat is coming in part from a warming planet, Congress told us this week it isn't going to do much about it, leaving it to President Biden to take matters into his own hands. Climate change is an emergency. And in the coming weeks, I'm going to use the power I have as president to turn these words into formal, official government action. While Europe is just as concerned about not having the natural gas it needs come winter because of a threatened Russia cutoff. Russia is blackmailing us. Russia is using energy as a weapon. And therefore, Europe needs to be ready. And while the commission was preparing for natural gas rationing, the European Central Bank moved on a different kind of heat, the heat of inflation. We decided to raise the three key ECB interest rates by 50 basis points and approved the transmission protection instrument. And when it comes to the markets, well, they generated their own kind of heat this week with the S&P 500 up over 2.5%. That's its best week in a month. And that was after it gave up almost 2% on Friday alone, in part because of disappointing reports from Snap and Twitter. While the Nasdaq was up 3 and a third percent while investors liked bonds as well, with the yield on the 10-year falling from 2.9 percent down to 2 and 3 quarters percent. To take us through it all, we welcome now Bob Michael. He's J.P. Morgan Asset Management CIO and head of fixed income, and Aaron Brown, portfolio manager at PIMCO. So, Aaron, let me start with you on equities and those earnings that we had. As I say, Snap and Twitter sort of disappointed. Overall, how are we doing with equities and earnings right now? So the bar was low going into earnings season, but that said, I think there are three main takeaways that we're hearing from the second quarter. You know, the first is that we saw real market accel acceleration downward in terms of demand trends and a softening really across the broad board. In the second quarter, um, we saw, you know, not just the early consumer cyclicals disappointing to the downside, which we heard in the first quarter, but we're now really starting to see that broaden out to the broader economy. You know, you mentioned the disappointment in earnings that we saw from Snapchat um, on Thursday, but you also saw negative earnings revisions lower from some of the consumer cyclicals, some of the industrials, some of the metals and mining company. And really what you're hearing a lot from corporates right now is that the consumer is, is weakening, but you're also starting to see business confidence also weaken. And you've started to see some of those advertiser dollars starting to get shrunk on the back of the fact that the demand environment just doesn't support it. The other, I think, key takeaway that you've started to see in the second quarter earnings season is inflation remains persistent. But what's new is that you're starting to see higher financing costs also start to really bite in terms of corporate profitability. And the interest rate increases that we've seen you know, on the back of the Fed raising rates has really started to hurt corporates in terms of their earnings profitability because it costs more now to 
finance. And the third, I think, key takeaway, and this is a real change in trend, is that the dollar strength is also starting to really impact the corporate profitability. We've seen the dollar rally about 6.5% in the second quarter. That shaves about 1.5% to 2% off of earnings. And you heard from corporates like Procter & Gamble, uh, Johnson & Johnson, as well as IBM, all to talk about you know uh, lower profitability ahead because of the the higher dollar and this isn't something that we've heard about really talked about since 2016 so that's a new wrinkle in terms of the outlook for the second half so bob that was equal time for the equity side of it what about on the bond side let me add one other softening number we had pmi numbers that came in on friday that were softer as well right I hear Erin, I understand everything she's saying. We have a completely different take on corporate America, and it starts with it's priced in. If you look at the start of the year, investment grade corporate bonds yielded somewhere around 2.4%. They're now yielding 4.6%. You look at high yield, it yielded under 5% at the start of the year. It's now yielding over 8%. So there's an awful lot of the bad news that Aaron talked about priced into the market. We look at those yields and we say this is the time to buy, particularly in high yield where you're being compensated for default rates that can go up to 6%. We look at where we think default rates are going to go. It's a much higher quality high yield bond market. 6% of it washed away in 2020. If you look at the amount in double B's, it's the highest ever, 53%. We think default rates only get up to 2.7%. The other thing we're noticing is that clients are returning to the bond market, especially corporate bonds. And it's because they have renewed confidence in the central banks. It started with the Fed 75 basis point increase, and it continued with the ECB's 50 basis point increase. So, Bob, I did see another bank that will go unnamed has a fund manager's report that came out this week that said this is the time to go into bonds, exactly what you just said. But, okay, so put that together with the Federal Reserve. We're going to hear from the FOMC this week. Is that saying we're thinking that they've gone as far as they're going to go or they're not going to go as far as we're thinking at least? Well, what it's telling us is the market is now fairly pricing in where they think the Fed should go. And the Fed is in sync with that. So we're talking about a Fed funds rate somewhere around 3.5% at year end. That's 200 basis points above where we are. If you go back to the start of the year, people were saying maybe the Fed will do one or two 25 basis point hikes. That was fantasy world. This is the real world. I think when I you pull... Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Aaron. Um, Aaron, go ahead. No, I, I just want to go back to Bob's earlier point to saying that it was priced in, because when you look at consensus earnings estimates for the second half of the year, they're still up about 10% year on year. And even if you look at 2023 estimates, they're up about 8 to 9% in terms of what market expectations are pricing in for next year. Now, the market right now, in terms of the equity land, is trading at about 16 times forward earnings, which is the average market multiple over the life cycle of the S&P 500. So we're trading at average market multiples, yet still pricing in pretty lofty earnings expectations for the second half of the year and 2023, which tells me that the market actually isn't fully priced for a recession at all. Certain segments of the market have certainly repriced lower and are pricing in, I think, more comfortable levels to start to dip your toe back in. But broadly think, speaking, I think the market is very mispriced for an oncoming recession. Remember, typically in recessions, we see EBITDA or earnings Earnings fall about 20% and EBITDA fall, you know, slightly less than that. But, but you know, th that would imply that we would have negative earnings over the next year, not positive earnings, which is, you know, currently consensus expectations. So, so we're, so we're, further. We're, we're looking at the corporate bond market and we think that where credit spreads have gotten to, where yields and corporate credit had gotten to, it priced in about 75% probability of recession. The other thing that we're very mindful of is our job is not to predict the economy. Our job is to predict the markets. And we were looking at yields that had doubled in corporate credit. And we were looking at a lot of cash on the sidelines. And you were looking at pension funds who were discounting their liabilities either side of 7% that could go into the top of the capital structure by buying high yield debt 
and getting over 8%. Those are the flows that we're seeing returning to the market. It's just begun. So, Aaron, Bob's put a number on the table, 75% chance of a recession. Within what period of time, Bob? Over the next 18 months. 18 months. What's your number? Yeah, I think that for a very mild recession, I think about 60% probability has been priced in. For a garden variety recession, I think only about 40% probability is priced in. I think that's more like what we're looking at over the next 12 months. And so the market's pricing in basically stagnating growth. I think it's going to be negative growth, which I think implies a that the market has fall, you know, further to reprice. On top of that, I think that yes, you you know, you have seen juicy yields emerge in corporate credit right now. A lot of that has been just based on the fact that we've seen the cash free rate increase, you know, pretty significantly since the start of the year based on federal Fed's hikes. So we haven't really seen spread widening. When you look at that same measure of spread widening versus historical recessionary periods, it would imply that you really haven't seen the market price in a full recession in terms of how far far, far spreads typically widen. Okay. IG corporates, I think, is much more attractively valued. I think that there is a place yeah. you can start dipping your toe in, but not with respect to high yield. Bob, last word on this subject. Uh, high yield credit spread started the year at 300 basis points. They got to 600 basis points. That's a doubling. They're now 500 basis points over. That's 200 basis points. You look at the quality of the high yield market, it's difficult to even get to a 3% default rate in a moderate recession. Forget about a mild okay. recession, a moderate recession. It's priced in. A great discussion on two sides of the house. Aaron Brown and Bob Michael are going to be staying with us. We're going to turn and take a look around the world at investment opportunities in places like China and Europe. Now, that's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. The real reason why we're optimistic is the underlying economic um, momentum is so strong. And um, I think that distinguishes Hong Kong and South China from almost anywhere else in the world at the present time. In your view, then, the, uh, Hong Kong is not going to be become like the rest of China. The rest of China is going to become like Hong Kong. Is that That's the way it looks at the moment, yes. That was Louis Ruckheiser talking with Robert Lloyd George 30 years ago on Wall Street Week. Since then, Hong Kong has reverted to China. China has joined the WTO, and the Chinese economy has grown from $427 billion to just about $17.7 trillion. But I have to say, I'm not sure it's because the rest of China has become more like Hong Kong. Still with us are Aaron Brown of PIMCO and Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan. So let's go around the world here a little bit, starting with China, if we could, Bob. Uh, when you look at the credit markets in China, bond markets in China, are they attractive to you? Yeah, they are. And, and China continues to struggle with the zero COVID policy and the constant shutdowns. So it's going to take a lot off of GDP. And because of that, we think that GDP will come in somewhere around 3%. You look at the 10-year China government bond, it's yielding about 2.8%. That looks to be pretty good value to us. I think for us, one of the bigger discussions we're having is what does zero COVID policy mean for recession and inflation? And, and unfortunately, it means stagflation. It means that you're taking out a large area of consumption, but you're still going to have the supply bottlenecks. That's not necessarily good for the rest of the economy. Aaron, what about is you? Is China investable right now? Yeah, this is somewhere where Bob and I actually agree. Um, you know, I think that you know, from a Chinese bond perspective, I think Chinese bonds do offer value, particularly in a global construct. That said, I think the big question mark for China right now is what they're going to do with respect to their currency. You know, I, I believe that their currency is likely going to continue to weaken in a zero COVID policy where growth really is handicapped. And as a result of that, I think that that likely means that it's going to really harbor poorly for the rest of the world. Remember, you know, historically, it's been difficult for emerging market assets to do well in environments where China growth is very weak. And particularly if China continues to weaken its currency or allow for its currency to gradually weaken, it also means that you won't likely see emerging market strength outside of China. What that ultimately means is that it's, it's pretty poor for global growth. I think 
people have been expecting, market ex um, investors have been expecting that you would likely see some type of recovery in China, you know, particularly um, this year and, and in the back half of this year. I don't think that we're going to get it, which makes, in my mind, China, China, Chinese risk assets pretty uninvestable right now. Th this is where I'm going to disagree with Aaron again. <laughs> we're back on track, Aaron, okay? <laughs> um, we're, we're looking at the rest of the emerging markets, emerging market debt, and we think that could be the surprise of the second half of the year. Well, Upside surprise? For the bond market, wow. absolutely. And if you look at the developed market central banks, really, when you look at the ECB just starting to raise rates, the Fed early on and the Bank of Japan not starting, in the emerging market since the start of 2021, 30 central banks have raised rates 170 times for a total of 15,000 basis points. <laughs> so those markets have anticipated inflation. They priced it in. There are high real yields there. People are afraid to go in because of inflation, because of the strong dollar. We think there's an opportunity there. You put together a basket of Brazil, South Africa, and Mexico, you've got a 7.25% yield. All you need is for the dollar to remain stable and not keep going up. All you need, Aaron. All you need is the dollar to remain sta stable. Bob took us, actually, to ECB. What about Europe? Yeah, well, I just want to go back to that point just really briefly. I mean, Bob, earlier you were saying you can get an 8% yield out of high yield. So why would you get a 7% yield out of emerging market assets if it's a lower quality asset with more FX risk on it? I think that in order to be bullish emerging market assets, you need twofold. You need one, to see a stabilization in global growth. And probably even much more importantly, you need to see inflation stabilize in emerging markets. Unless and until you see EM uh, you know, uh, inflation stabilizing, you're going to continue to see those central banks chasing um, and trying to get in control of inflation. And that just means that, you know, likely you're see, going to see higher rates in emerging markets. So I think it's too early right now to call for a buy in emerging market assets in emerging market bonds. With respect to Europe, you know, I think that Europe is really challenged right now. And that's, you know, largely as, as a result of the fact that they have much higher um, reliance on energy and um, gas from from Russia than uh, the rest of the world and particularly versus the U.S. And so I think that you're going to see a real impairment to uh, European corporates in the second half of the year because of higher energy costs. And I also think that you're going to see a forced um, curtailment of industrial uh, energy usage, which is, means that corporate profitability in Europe is going to be quite weak. I do think that you know, based on some of the PMI data that we got over the last 48 hours out of Europe, that we're likely in a recession in the third quarter in Europe at the start of a recession. And you'll likely see that re recession um, conditions ensue over the next few quarters. So I, I think that Europe is a real bleak spot in terms of the global growth trajectory. So, Sir Rebuttal? Yeah, I'm going back to emerging markets. I knew you were. I knew you because were. Because I think there are three sovereigns who aren't going to be really happy that they just got compared to below investment grade U.S. corporates. So let's put that to the side. Europe, yeah, I, I, here I agree with Aaron. That they've got a real problem. It looks like inflation is going to remain structurally high. The ECB is going to do what they can to slow down consumption. Ultimately, we like sovereign debt there, but but we like Germany. We're not necessarily sold on Italy yet. So we're sticking in the sovereign side. Uh, we think there's some normalization and policy to come from the ECB, but they're not going to get anywhere near as high as in rates as, as the Federal Reserve. So, Aaron, to put you on the spot, what's the worst problem for Europe right now? Uh, the collapse of the government in Italy or the problem that ECB faces, and particularly Russian natural gas? I think energy is by far the number one problem that Europe is facing right now. You know, for, for Italy specifically, certainly the collapse of the government is a challenge, but I think that the much larger looming risk out there is the curtailment in what's going to be in supply in, you know, into Europe for natural gas and what that ultimately is going to mean for demand destruction um, that's necessary to come from it. What does that say to you as a bond investor in Europe? Well, it, it says a couple of things. It, it tells us to be careful on corporate Europe because the input cost pressures aren't going to go away anytime soon. It tells us that the ECB can only raise rates so high, maybe one and a half, one and three quarters percent. That's about it. 
and it means that you're going to want that flight to quality. So as I said, uh, German government debt is the place for us to be there. So last question here, Aaron. Uh, you heard Bob say, provided we have a stable dollar. What do you expect the dollar to do from here on out? Will it continue to strengthen against other currencies? Unfortunately, I think we're still in a period of dollar exceptionalism, which means that because of the you know, somewhat relative better growth trajectory of the U.S. versus Europe, because of the less reliance on you know, Russia as a source of natural gas and energy, and, and because of the, the defensive properties of the, the dollar, I do think that the dollar is likely to remain quite robust over you know, the, the next couple of quarters. And so I, I think that the dollar is likely going to continue to strengthen. Do you agree with Aaron on that one, Bob? No, I, I think the dollar <laughs> has peaked. Um, and, and even Aaron was talking about you know, the downside to the U.S. economy. Um, the dollar's gone as far as it can. It's really stretched versus all currencies. Okay, the main thing I want to know is, is there a PIMCO versus J.P. Morgan softball game this summer? Because I would like to be there. I'd like to see what respective positions you both play. Because it would be a feisty one. But it's been really great having you both on. We really need that kind of uh, constructive disagreement. Thank you so much to Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management and Aaron Pimco, Aaron Brown of PIMCO. Up next, we're going to look ahead to next week on Wall Street. And that's on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time now for a peek ahead at next week on Global Wall Street, starting with Juliet Sally in Singapore. Thanks, David. A big week on the earnings front with Samsung, Rio Tinto and Yum China among those releasing numbers. Labor issues, supply chains, inflation and the energy crisis among some of the major themes we'll be watching out for in the post earnings calls. Plus, a report from China in the week ahead likely to show profit growth stalled at industrial companies in the first half of 2022. That's thanks to COVID lockdowns. Meanwhile, Australia's headline inflation could hit a 21 year high of 6 percent and inflation is is likely to climb above 65% in crisis hit Sri Lanka. Here in Europe, we're looking ahead to the biggest week of the earnings season with the region's top banks, automakers, airlines and energy companies all reporting. Investors, of course, will be scrutinising any commentary on inflation, supply chains, labour costs and anything executives say about their concerns around a recession. We will be bringing you executive interviews from the likes of Ryanair, Deutsche Bank and Shell, just to name a few. It is also a big week when it comes to the economic data. We're expecting inflation prints out on Thursday and Friday and a GDP number out for the Eurozone on Friday. It's a huge week for investors who have to parse the state of the economy through a slew of economic data on both sides of the Atlantic, including inflation and GDP numbers, plus a barrage of corporate earnings. Big tech is on deck from Apple to Microsoft. We know there's plans to slow hiring, but just how worried are the biggest and fastest growing companies in the S&P 500 about the consumer? We'll get that answer from another angle, too. It's not just big tech. Household names like Coca-Cola, McDonald's, and even Chevron will shed light on just how much faith they have in spending ability around the world and just how dangerous the dollar is to their bottom line. But the big event will be on Wednesday, with the Federal Reserve expected to hike interest rates by 75 basis points, despite some Wall Street banks still calling for 100 as their base case. Is the market prepared? We'll find out next week. Thanks to Juliet Sally, Tom McKenzie, and Kriti Gupta. Coming up, if we're headed toward a recession, why haven't U.S. consumers gotten the memo? We ask Bank of America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Recession. It's what we fear and what some tell us is either inevitable. Unfortunately, I think a recession is going to be inevitable. Or much more likely than not. If we're all uh, talking ourselves uh, into recession, 
uh, and, and being very pessimistic, the, the odds are that we, you know, we lose faith and, and we go into recession. And we certainly have some of the elements in negative growth for the first quarter and growth that is at best subdued for the second. There's probably close to a 50-50 chance, maybe it's a bit less than that, that we've had two negative quarters in a row. But then again, we have employment that we've rarely seen. We simply have a very strong unemployment situation, a very strong labor market that's continuing to fuel uh, consumer spending, keeping the economy moving forward. And twice as many job openings as there are people looking for work. Right now, the labor market is extremely tight and I would say unsustainably hot. And strong retail sales. The main measure of consumer goods, people were actually buying fewer goods over the past few months. And the major banks telling us the consumer is strong. They're going out, they're traveling, they're doing things, they're getting dressed up, they're going to weddings, they're going back to the office, uh, they're going out to dinner more. So how can it be that we're heading for a recession when so much of the U.S. economy is still bathed in sunlight? Bank of America has one of the best possible vantage points on the economy overall and on the U.S. consumer in particular. So we took the question of how to reconcile all the conflicting data points to the man at the top, Chair and CEO Brian Moynihan, starting with what he sees in the state of the consumer. I just saw the data for the first few weeks of July. And, you know, the end of the day, in, in the, for the first couple weeks of July, the consumers in the aggregate spent across debit cards, credit cards, checks for it and Zell, money out of the AT cash out of the ATMs, cash it from tellers, all, all the different ways they spent it. They spent about nine or nine percent plus more than they spent in the first two weeks of July of 21. Um, the transaction volume grew at six or seven percent, six percent plus. That means people are doing more things. And so the consumer spending is strong. The second thing is the customers have in their accounts more money mid-month of July than they did in, in, in June. And so they, they continue to build their account balances, especially in the lower wage earning populations we have in our customer base. We serve all these customers. So to give you a sense, the customer that pre-pandemic would have had you know, one to 2,000 of average balances in their accounts had an average of 14, now has 7,000 plus in that account, that same customer two and a half years later. The customer had between two and five, average 3,500 come forward two and a half years later, they have 13,000. So there's money in accounts. And by the way, they're not going down. They went up a little around tax refunds. They came down when they spent some tax refunds and that was April, May. And then you saw them start to grow in June and you're seeing it continue in July. So they're, they have money in accounts. The third thing is, are they borrowing? And the answer is, we're seeing some growth in our credit cards, some growth in our home equity balances, uh, stabilization in our mortgage balances. But at the end of the day, they have plenty of capacity in home equity to borrow. They were $30 billion pre-pandemic. The loans are now in the low 20s, so there's that capacity. Credit cards were $95 billion pre-pandemic. They're now 80, mid-80s moving up. There's that capacity, plus there's other lines. So there's capacity to borrow. The home values are still strong, so that's good. So as you look across all that data, you say the consumer is strong. Now, when you do a survey, of what consumers feel like. They say you know, consumer sentiment's down, and that's because they read about inflation, they hear about inflation. So the answer is what they're saying they see versus what they're doing is kind of interesting. And then you look at the unemployment levels and wage growth, and it's strong. So that's the conundrum. That's the Fed's toughest challenge. You have a strong consumer, and they need to slow down the economy. And that's, that's, a, that's a lot of work. And so we see everything constructive on a consumer side in, in our database. And by the way, the wealthy customer is the same thing, except for, frankly, they had to pay more taxes in the second quarter, 50% uh, more by estimates than last year. So therefore, their balances went down, and now they're recovering. So, so, Brian, I think you just put your finger on one of the questions, certainly that's perplexing to me, that uh, a lot of the data indicate the consumer is really strong, but the consumer sentiment is really, really weak. How could it be that good when we feel that bad about it? And I guess the follow on question that is, can we talk ourselves into a downturn? How much of this is sentiment and how much of this is behavior? Well, a couple of things. So, you know, my experience with consumers across the years, especially around the investment side, which, you know, I, I ran for the company before I was CEO for a bunch of years, you, you, you could see the stock market trading volume of retail customers, you know, correlate with sentiment. So, you know, when people f don't feel good, they don't put as much money in the equity market and you're seeing a kickback in a little bit now, but, you know, it, that went down a lot. And so there's, you know, these things do play off each other. So the sentiment out there plays off of 
stock market levels, house price belief, uh, whether you know the debate about whether I'm going to have a job, all those things play off. But the actual behavior plays off of really one straightforward thing. Do I have a job and am I getting paid? And if I have a job and I'm getting paid, I pay my bills, you know, I can provide for my family, I can take my vacations, I can buy the new car and all those things. You know, and that that right now, you know, unemployment in the three you know, mid threes is, is a very low unemployment rate. And so that's why the consumers, you know, are spending, even though they may not feel good because they're being told, worry about a European war, worry about an energy crisis, worry about a food crisis. And by the way, there's inflation and really worry about that. And inflation, you know, there's been many quotes about inflation that people have dragged out, but it's insidious and it gets on people's minds and it causes a behavior change. It just hasn't changed it yet. And that's the key point. It hasn't changed it yet. And if they get it right, it ought to start feeling better. And then maybe it won't have to change it as much. As you say, employment is probably the single biggest indicator of where we're headed in the economy overall. Employment is extremely strong right now. But does that suggest that if, in fact, we're to have a recession, which many people, including Bank of America, project, that we have to get a lot more unemployment pretty quickly? Well, that's that's kind of the interesting thing. If you look at the blue chip uh, economist and you look at our economist and you look at the street economists, a subset of the blue chip economists, I was just kind of looking through it. And so uh, the you know, 10 or 11 large investment banks have economists. I think we and one other one have a you know, a negative part in 22 or, or 23, the rest of you have a very slow growth. So you went from a 5% growth rate to, you know, maybe a 2% growth rate or even less uh, down to, you know, really no growth. So you're seeing this thing slow down. The interesting thing is all of them still have unemployment. You know, if you take the blue chip and look at it, the highest is like 5%, which doesn't seem consistent with a recession uh, of a level people are predicting because remember we were 5% unemployment moving down to 17 and things like that. So it's a little hard to figure out how people can predict the economy slowing that much in employment staying as strong as because the averages are in the you know low fours. And that that that's something I think either people adjust one side or the other side. If you listen to the you know, Fed chair, he'll he'll talk about they need to have labor markets that's not so tight and it's very tight now, two job openings for every job. But that is that is kind of the conundrum that when I look down all those stats, I sort of say, wait a second, how can you have that kind of slow economic growth, but that kind of strong employment in the absolute sense coexist? And the answer is one's got to give, and we'll see. One more data point, uh, Brian, if I may. You also have access into a lot of American business, and not just the really big ones, but small and medium-sized enterprises as well, right across the country. What are they mainly worried about as you talk to them? Well, number one, the activity in our small business, 5 million under revenue companies, that core small business, were one of the largest, if not the largest player in it by far. As I said earlier, the origination activity, new loans originated, was up about 10% year over year, to uh, 2.9 billion versus 2.6, 2.7. So that's good. That means they're still demanding credit. Okay. And then we looked at the small business, again, 5 million under revenue co- uh, companies, they're use of their small business credit cards, that's growing in double digits plus. That means they're using the, these are the business cards, using it to buy things and do things. So that's that's strong. What they were worried about in our surveys that we do for inflation, uh, I, for them that's input, you know, costs going up, wage, getting people and how much they have to pay them, can't even find them if I wanna pay them. And then can I fill the orders I have? And so if you talk to, you know, the manufacturing people are saying, my problem is the supply chain still are bumping around. And I, I've got stuff that I could, I've got orders out the, you know, out through, you know, year end, next year, no problem at all. I just got to get the stuff in to, and I need all the p- component parts to complete the thing and then sell it. I've got 60%, 70%, 80%, and I need to get the labor to do it. And that, that you know, it's a very difficult time to manage that sort of uh, mechanism. But the good news is they've got committed contracts to take the stuff when it's done. And so... Mm-hmm. The supply chain has pushed out the demand cycle a little bit because there's just a lot of stuff that still has to be manufactured and sold, you know, in, in various industries and that, you know, 50 million and under revenue company, they all, they all worry about all the things you read about in the paper because they read the same papers and think about them and they actually see them in day-to-day execution, supply chain tightness, labor tightness, input uh, prices. But on the other hand, what they also see is good demand for their products and services, which gives them optimism. That was Brian Moynihan, chair and CEO of Bank of America. Coming up, we wrap up the week once again with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and we are joined once again by our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, one of the big developments of this week was the European Central Bank, which made an historic move of 50 basis points, also implemented a new emergency policy. What did you make of what they did? Look, I think they had to do it. Uh, Europe's got a serious inflation problem. Yes, a lot of it's coming from the supply side. But if you don't respond, it becomes entrenched and that much more expensive to eradicate. They've got an aspect to their problem that we don't have in the United States, uh, coming out of the fact that they're a monetary union rather than just a monetary system. And so if you're going to have to administer substantial shocks to contain inflation, you're going to have to insulate the European economy and the weaker credits in the European economy from that. And that's what they uh, had to do. I think all things uh, considered, uh, they took uh, the right kind of steps. And this is pushing Europe in the right direction in a dangerous situation. I was very sorry to see the political developments uh, in Italy, which are yet another example of one of the great challenges of our times, which is uh, populist leadership and populist politics um, unsettling the prospects for rational policy making and creating greater challenges in the long run. I, strongly suspect that Italy will regret that Mario Draghi did not have a longer run as prime minister and head of government. Well, take those two and put them together, Larry, actually, the politics of Italy on the one hand and the, and the monetary policy of the ECB. Did the ECB try to address some of that with their new policy? It was unclear exactly how it gets implemented to try to keep the spreads on the bonds, for example, between Italy and Germany in check. I mean, here's the ECB's problem, David, it's, uh, you know, to use a phrase from the security area, it's double deterrence. They want, on the one hand, to deter the speculators from speculating against Italy and other per periphery uh, countries. That requires a confident sense that, you, that the ECB is going to stand behind them. On the other hand, they don't want to finance unlimited spending, and so they want to put pressure on countries to manage their affairs responsibly. So that points towards an element of conditionality. But the more the conditionality is credible to the countries, the more it's unsettling to the markets. The more confidence you give the markets, the more the countries feel that they don't need to do their part in terms of making painful uh, policy adjustments. So it's a very difficult balance uh, to strike. And I think this was a reasonable move forward in uh, striking uh, that balance, but it's not going to be easy going forward. One of the other things that we heard from um, Madame Lagarde is something you and I have talked about in con con connection with the Fed, which is forward guidance. It sounds to me like essentially the ECB saying, we're out of the business of foreign gu forward guidance. We'll take it meeting by meeting. David, except for some quite particular, quite unusual circumstances, I think forward guidance is generally a mistake for central banks. Forward guidance tends to run into the problem that the market doesn't believe it very much, so it's not very impactful. And the central bank takes its own credibility seriously, and it's constrained down the road by the forward guidance that it gave in the past. So except for very extreme deflationary situations, I think forward guidance is a tool that is better off kept in the closet. Larry, back in the United States, we've got a number of important events coming up next week. We've got uh, a meeting in the FOMC. Uh, we also have a really important potentially data coming out, particularly PCE, core PCE and otherwise, and also the ECI numbers. What are you going to be looking at? Look, I think the most interesting and informative number is going to be the ECI uh, number, David. The wage picture is mixed. Uh, the average hourly earnings data that come out in each employment report have been relatively favorable and benign for the last several months. On the other hand, the last Atlanta Fed report, which looks at 
the wage changes for particular individuals and therefore controls for composition issues was really quite alarming. And so there's a divergence between uh, those two reports that is not well understood. And I think we'll get greater clarity on that when we see what happens with uh, the employment cost index. If wage inflation is continuing to accelerate, which is what you would tend to think, given how high vacancies are relative to unemployment, that's going to be a very concerning sign. If somehow, despite everything, wage growth is uh, slowing, that's got to be reassuring to the Fed in terms of the risks of uh, entrenched inflation. So I think that's going to be a very revealing and informative uh, number when it comes. I think at this point, most people kind of have a 75 basis point increase locked in for the Fed. And I don't think they expect the Fed to make uh, dramatic news with any policy um, announcements. I think the PCE number can be previewed pretty well on the basis of what happened in uh, the CPI. It's likely to look a bit better, but we've still got a very serious slog of inflation ahead of us. For the medium term, uh, a huge amount is going to depend on what happens with uh, commodity prices. Uh, the agreement reached this morning that suggests that Ukrainian wheat may at long last flow to the rest of the world. That was certainly an encouraging uh, sign. But there are huge overhangs of uncertainty surrounding the oil market. And uh, while it's not what's currently priced into the forward market, I think we have to recognize that there are real risks of substantial oil spikes. Larry, we're all focused on the Fed as the front line of defense, as it were, against inflation. At the same time, is it only the Fed? Are there things we can do in fiscal policy at this point that can address the inflation issue? Look, fiscal policy makes a big difference. This is not the time for stimulative fiscal policies like continuing moratoriums on student debt relief. This is not the time for anything that's going to be a big new spending program. In fact, it's the time for short-term uh, deficit reduction. That's why I'm so disappointed that the idea seems to be gaining currency that you shouldn't raise taxes when uh, there's inflation. I actually think that just the right thing to do is to raise uh, taxes uh, right now to take some of the demand out of the economy. We can raise substantial revenue by cl cutting corporate tax loopholes. In fact, if we don't do it, we're likely to lose what I think was a huge accomplishment for the Biden administration, the Global Tax Cooperation Agreement that Secretary Yellen uh, concluded. We can generate significant revenues simply by enforcing the tax law and taking some of the spent, taking some of the money out of high-income tax evaders who then go and spend the money, and that'll contribute to reduced inflation uh, as well. So I sure wish we could get past this uh, basically ludicrous economic idea that tax increases are uh, inflationary. It's just not right. Okay, one quick one here at the end, Larry. We had a lot of earnings out of tech, particularly Snap and also Twitter. Uh, they didn't do so well this week. Is that tell us, telling us anything broader? Look, I think what you're seeing in tech is what you kind of always see, which is just when government's getting aroused that something is a source of monopoly power and earning excess profits, that tends to be when it peaks in the marketplace. That's how it was with IBM many years ago. That's how it was with Microsoft. And I think we're seeing some elements of that with this advertisement-supported tech businesses right now. Okay, Larry, always such a pleasure to have you with us, and a privilege, really. That's Larry Summers of Harvard, our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week.
Coming up, what aren't our leaders telling us, and why not? That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Stranger Things. Sure, it's a hit series that came to Netflix's rescue and earnings this week. What do you think, Mike? It's risky as hell. But it's also a fair description of a lot of what we're all seeing these days. Everything from record heat in Europe. The scorching heat wave tormenting Europe is pushing power systems to the edge. To a slowing economy while consumers keep spending. There's a lot of uncertainty. You guys have been talking about it all day. Higher recession odds, uh, slower growth. To supply chain problems that just won't go away. Now we see the weak, weak links in the supply chain. But sometimes it seems as if our leaders hope that if they don't tell us the bad news, it will simply take care of itself. Remember back after 9-11 when President George W. Bush told us all we could help in the war on terror by doing more shopping? We cannot let the terrorists achieve the objective of uh, frightening our nation to the point where we don't, uh, where we don't conduct business where people don't shop. That's, that's their intention. Or Fed Chair Jay Powell telling us more recently that inflation was only transitory, long past the point when we knew otherwise. We don't expect that those, uh, that, that upward pressure will produce uh, substantially higher prices or that the effects will be persistent. We expect that they'll be transitory or temporary. And it doesn't look like we've learned our lesson. We all know that gas prices are way too high, even if they have come down a bit. But when President Biden talks about the problem, he pulls out every trick in the book except the one that's most obvious, just asking us to buy less gas. Today I'm calling on Congress to suspend the federal gas tax, calling on states to either suspend the state gas tax as well. I'm calling on the industry to refine more oil into gasoline. Or what about coming up with a plan for that BA5 subvariant that could wreak havoc on yet another winter? Clearly, it needs to be taken seriously because the BA5 variant has what we call a transmission advantage over the prior variants. And maybe the biggest one of them all, really doing something about climate rather than just talking about it. No president in the future would walk into the White House and undo what is going on around the world. This is bigger than the United States. But this week, maybe we saw the pattern broken when Europe finally admitted the obvious, that if Russia cuts the natural gas supply, everyone is going to have to cut way back. We have to reduce our gas consumption. I know this is a big ask for the whole of the European Union, but it is necessary to, to protect us. Every member state should reduce the use of gas. And our second objective is we provide a safety net for all member states. Maybe other leaders can take a page from the European book so that the rest of us don't have to resort to a super-powered teenager to save the day like the kids of Hawkins in Stranger Things. Chances of success are 20 to 1. Never tell me the odds. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.